Hi everyone and welcome to the 8th grade English language arts video lesson. My name is Kaylin Bryce and I am an English teacher at Huguenot High School. I am so excited to be working with you today and I will be working with you all week. While I present my screen, take this opportunity to grab some paper and a pen or a pencil. Welcome to class. Before we begin, let's play a game. I have a list of contents of a locker. Let's read through the list of contents together and try and figure out who owns this locker. While I read the list to you, take this opportunity to jot down your guesses about who or the type of person it is that owns this locker. Ready? Black football cleats. Four textbooks, math, science, English, and social studies. Two crumpled papers, a detention slip, and a welcome to eighth grade English syllabus. A note from Jada Smith on the top shelf. Candy bar wrappers. A winter coat and hat. of paper. Take a couple more seconds before I show you my guesses. Okay, so for my guesses, I thought that the locker belongs to a boy. Why do I think that the locker belongs to a boy? Well, the presence of the black football cleats tip me off to think that it might be a boy's locker. Boys are typically the ones that play football. Second, I think that he might be in eighth grade. Why do I think that he's in eighth grade? Well, he did have a crumpled, eighth grade English syllabus in his locker, which makes me think that he is probably in eighth grade. Three, I think he might get in trouble sometimes. Now, I don't know if he gets in trouble all the time or if this was just a one kind of occasion, but he had a crumpled detention slip in his locker. Four, he might play football. He had football cleats in his locker. Now, it doesn't mean that he does play football, but it makes me think that he might. Five, he might be friends with Jada Smith or six, Jada Smith might have a crush on him. She wrote him a note and he saved it in his locker. Now he could have forgotten about it. She could be a random person, but I'm thinking that she might be friends with him or she might have a crush on him. He has a sweet tooth. Why do I think he has a sweet tooth? Well, he did have candy wrappers in his locker, which makes me think that he ate the candy inside the wrappers and then just happened to leave them in his locker. So maybe he's a little messy too. And finally, I think it might be cold where he lives. Either it's cold all the time or it just happens to be cold right now because he had a winter hat and a coat in his locker. Now, it is possible that he left those things in his locker for a while, but it's also likely that he's currently using those items. If you made any guesses similar to mine based on the evidence inside the locker, congratulations. 
you're ready for today's lesson because you made an inference. Today's lesson and for the rest of the week, we are going to be focus on, focusing on making inferences and drawing conclusions in fictional texts. Before we get started, let's, let's review the learning objective for today that will be our learning objective for the rest of the week. Verbs are shaded, which are our action words, and nouns, which are people, places, or things, are underlined. This week, we are going to make inferences and draw conclusions based on explicit and implied information using references to the text for support. And remember, this is in fictional text. Today, we are primarily going to be focused on making inferences, and later in the week, we will look at drawing conclusions. But everything that we do this week, we will be using references to the text for support. That's our text evidence. Our learning target for today is, today I will be able to define inferences and make an inference using text evidence and background knowledge. So what is an inference? Maybe you've heard this word before, or maybe it's completely new to you. I'm about to show you the definition for inference. Take this time to copy the definition down onto your piece of paper. An inference is a logical or evidence-based guess using text evidence and background knowledge. Once again, an inference is a logical guess based on text evidence and background knowledge. You may pause the video now to copy the definition or take a few more moments to write it down. So what is text evidence and background knowledge and how does it help us make an inference? I like to think of the text evidence and background knowledge as almost a mathematical equation to lead us to getting our inference. We need both text evidence and background knowledge in order to make an inference. We can't just have text evidence and we can't just have background knowledge. We need both. I'm going to show you the definitions for text evidence and background knowledge. It might be a good idea to copy down some notes, especially if you're unfamiliar. So text evidence is a piece of information from the text and it's used to support an inference the reader makes. When we were playing our locker game, what was our text evidence? Correct, our text evidence was the list of items inside the locker. It was specific evidence from the text or the locker that was helping us learn or try and predict who the owner of the locker was. Now, I can't just use the text evidence and decide who the owner of the locker is. I also need background knowledge. Background knowledge is information the reader already knows. It's what you bring to the table as a reader. Take a moment to copy down some notes on background knowledge. When I was looking at the lists of text evidence from the locker, I saw that the locker had black football cleats. If that's my text evidence, I'm going to add to it my background knowledge of boys play football. Therefore, my inference or my logical guess would be the owner is a boy. Take the text evidence of candy wrappers. What is your background knowledge that you can add to that piece of text evidence to make an inference. My background knowledge that I use is 
they're empty candy wrappers. That means that the owner of the locker probably ate the candy inside of the wrapper. Now, I can't say any of these things for certain. Maybe someone else stuffed the empty candy wrappers in his locker, but it's more likely that the owner of the locker themselves ate that candy. My text evidence is that the owner had a welcome to eighth grade English syllabus in his locker. My background knowledge is on the first day of class, you get a syllabus. And if he had one for eighth grade English, my inference is probably that he is in eighth grade. And I know that we just learned the definition for inference, but let's test your memory. What is an inference? An inference is a logical guess based on text evidence and background knowledge. An evidence-based guess. Before we move to our activity, let's do a fill in the blank to really review what an inference is. You take the notes that you need that will help you remember this important information. Inferences are really important. And I like to think of them as mystery solving because sometimes writers give information or express ideas directly. They say exactly what they mean. That's also called being explicit. However, we need inferences, especially for the other times when writers convey their meaning indirectly or implicitly. They don't say exactly what they mean. That's why I think it's a little bit of a mystery because we're taking our text evidence clues and all that good knowledge we come to the table with and we're making evidence-based guesses like detectives. So if a writer does not tell you exactly what they mean, if they're being indirect, you need to infer or read between the lines. Making inferences is about connecting the dots between what is stated and what is unstated. If something's stated, that means that the writer has said it directly or explicitly. If it is unstated, that means that the writer is saying it indirectly or is implying what they mean. As a reader, you have a job to do because you need to combine what the passage says, 100 bonus points for the person who can give us another word for passage says. Right, text evidence. So if you can combine what the passage says with your background knowledge to make the best possible guess or inference. Take a couple of moments to copy down any notes or information you need. We know that writers often tell us more than what they directly say or what they explicitly say. They give us hints or clues, meaning that they're implying information that will help us read between the lines. We use these clues to get a deeper meaning of the text, and that's called inferring. Let's move on to making an inference from a piece of information. We'll take the clues that we have and try and figure out what's happening. On my screen, you'll see that I have a table with three columns, text evidence, background knowledge, and inference. Before we begin, draw a table on your piece of paper and leave enough room for multiple examples. Our first example is asking us, can you infer where I am? 
the writer is not telling us directly or explicitly where they are. Instead, the writer is giving us clues to indirectly or implicitly tell us where they are. Let's read the example and see if we can come up with where the writer is. The example says, I hear a loud thwack as the ball leaves the ballpark and the crowd roars with cheers. Hmm. As I read that, I heard some very key pieces of text evidence. As I read it, I heard two things. I heard that the ball makes a thwack sound and that the crowd is loud and cheering. Now I pulled these pieces of text evidence because the ball can tell us where they are. What is happening to the ball can tell us where the author is. And the fact that there is a crowd can tell us where the author is. I don't know about you, but I don't run into a lot of crowds cheering in my daily life. <laughs> I wish my students cheered <laughs> in the classroom because they love English, but not always the case. So using those two pieces of text evidence, how can I use those to make an inference? Well, I can't use them on their own. I need to combine background knowledge. So, number one, for the ball to make a thwack sound, that tells me it must have been hit by something. Balls just don't make thwack sounds, okay? Number two, I know that sports and games use balls. And number three, because the crowd is loud and cheering, it probably means that they're excited. So a ball is hit by something and then the crowd is loud and cheering. Can we infer where the author is, even though they did not explicitly or directly tell us? Write down where you think the author is. Okay, I think the author is at a baseball game. Did you think that too? The ball was probably hit by a bat and the player probably got a home run or a run that put them on base and that made the crowd loud and cheering because they were excited that their team might now be winning. We're going to move on to another example. So make sure in your table you have enough room for extra text evidence, background knowledge, and inferences. You can draw a line underneath this example. Okay, let's do this one together. Number two says, can you infer where I am and what I am doing? So two parts, where and what. The example says, I see bubbles rising. I hear my own breathing. There are fish swimming above me. I feel the seaweed swaying. Take a few moments and pull out any important pieces of text evidence and list them in the text evidence column of your table. If you need more time, feel free to pause the video. Okay, so my text evidence. One, bubbles are rising. Two, fish are swimming. Three, there is seaweed. I think all of those are going to help me if I apply my background knowledge to infer where the author is and what they are doing. At this time, take a few moments and write down background knowledge that will help you take the text evidence and make an inference. You may pause the video at this time if you need more time. My background knowledge. Breathing underwater makes air bubbles. If you are swimming and you just breathe out, 
air bubbles will rise to the surface. However, you can't breathe underwater. So the author must be doing something that is allowing them to continuously breathe underwater. I can certainly jump in the pool and go and see some bubbles, but I'm not actually breathing. Hmm. So I think the author is doing something that's letting them breathe. Number two, fish swim in water. That gives me a pretty good indication of where the author is. Because if fish are swimming, it's 100% in water. Unless this is some fantasy novel and fish can swim in other types of environments. And number three, the author said seaweed. Seaweed doesn't occur in many places besides for oceans. So while fish can swim in lakes, ponds, rivers, oceans, seaweed is really only in oceans. So that narrows down for me where I am and what I'm doing. Now, if I just took my text evidence without applying my background knowledge, I might get the wrong answer. But because I've broken down my text evidence with my background knowledge, I'm pretty confident that my inference is correct. Take a moment and write down where you infer the author is and what they are doing. All right. My inference is. I am scuba diving in the ocean. Definitely thought that I was in the ocean because fish swim in water and there's seaweed. So it's probably, I'm probably seeing the fish swimming in the seaweed in the ocean. How did I know that I was scuba diving and not just swimming? One, I saw bubbles rising, which means air was coming out of my mouth. Two, I heard my own breathing. Now, unless I had some breathing device, like a scuba diving mask and tank, I wouldn't be breathing under the water. I'd be holding my breath until I could resurface, which leads me to believe that I am scuba diving in the ocean. When we infer, we want to pay specific close attention to that, those text evidence details and really use all of our background knowledge to make sure we understand what the author is doing. On this slide, you will see three more examples of statements from which you need to make an inference. You can pause the video now to complete your inferences for these three statements, or you can watch until the end of the video and come back. We will review these answers together tomorrow. Feel free to continue to use your table or any graphic organizer that helps you organize your thoughts and keep them clear. Great work today, everybody. But before you go, let's review some of the things that we learned today. Number one, what is an inference? Take a moment and jot down your answer or discuss with an adult at home. What is an inference? If you said an inference is a logical guess based on text evidence and background knowledge, you'd be correct. Great job. Number two, how does a reader make an inference? Take a moment to jot down your answer or discuss with someone at home with you. How does a reader make an inference? There's two things that a reader needs in order to make an inference. A reader needs to find specific text evidence and combine that text evidence with their background knowledge in order to make an inference. And number three, and this one's a little bit trickier, you're gonna to have to think a little deeper. Why is it important for readers 
to continuously make inferences. Take a moment to write your answer down or discuss with an adult at home. Why is it important for readers to make inferences? It's important for readers to make inferences because sometimes authors do not directly or explicitly say what they mean. Very often, in order to make the text more interesting, an author will imply or indirectly say what they mean. In order for readers to have a deeper meaning and understanding of the text, they need to make inferences between what is stated and unstated in order to understand the text. Great work, everybody. What are we learning tomorrow? Tomorrow, we are going to review what we learned today, which were inferences, text evidence, and background information. Additionally, we are going to learn tips for making inferences, which will be very helpful. And then we're going to take those tips and everything we learned today to make inferences in passages from fictional texts. Furthermore, we are going to learn what types of text evidence work best for making inferences. Thank you so much for all your hard work today, and we will see you tomorrow.